This is a t-shirt my dad gave me a number of years ago. I only wear it in the house. For those of you that don't know what this is, this is that guy right back there, comic book character, um, Captain America. That, by the way, is a, is a puzzle, a, a puzzle from my dad's mom. And uh, I used to put that together when I was a little kid. And you're saying, okay, so what is this Captain America puzzle and Captain America t-shirt have? Well, I don't really have anything patriotic else in my house. I don't have patriotic shirt or anything like this. And in this study, I'm going to put it up to air for the 4th of July, uh, the celebration of the, uh, our country and its, its birth, its freedom that, that we uh, have. I'm having said all of that, um, I'm obviously, you see, I'm deviating from where we are in our regular studies right now, but I wanted to share this study today um, just to encourage you as believers. I trust this is for believers. If you're not a believer, well, I will come back to the gospel here eventually, uh, so please stick around for that. But if you are a believer, I want you to think about your citizenship. Are we as are we Christian versions of Captain America, or is there something different that we might have? I'm going to take a look at that today. I'm Pastor Tim Holsher. We're going to start off today in Ephesians chapter two, and the Apostle Paul writes, and he's writing to to these Ephesian believers, and in particular, I believe in the context, he's writing to Gentiles, uh, which would have. Some of them may have been Roman citizens. Some of them likely were not. But verse 19 of chapter 2, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens of the saints and of God's household, and being built on a foundation from the apostles and prophets. Point being, these people did not, going into earlier context, did not have a, a contact with God. They did not have a relationship with the people of God. They were strangers. Those two terms, strangers and aliens, are really ways of saying you were non-citizens with regard to the people of Israel. Now, Paul is not going to tell them that they have been made part of Israel. That's a whole other study. But they are now citizens of this household of God, a household in which God's taken Jews and Gentiles and put them together in something different than the nation of Israel. I realize that's not popular within mainstream evangelicalism. But I don't believe that uh, church believers, Gentiles or Jews today, really are part of the people of Israel. But the main point, we're strangers and aliens out there in the world, but we're not when we're in Christ. And Peter likewise writes, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Beloved, I urge or I encourage you as aliens and strangers, in other words, those people who uh, don't you're living someplace, but it's not your home. It's not where you have your citizenship. That's what the idea is. And he's going to tell them a number of things in the context that he says that they should do. Some of those things, if we were to go on down in this context, that he's going to say you should think about doing these things is um, you should watch your conduct so that where they uh, slander you as evildoers, they can observe your good conduct. And then he tells them in verse 13 to submit uh, for your for the Lord's sake to every human institution, to kings, to those authorities, governors over them. He just said, submit to them. And this goes back to the fact, this isn't really your home. In fact, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, and I come back to this passage many times where he says, our citizenship is in heaven, and this is literally a plural, in heavens, from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, our citizenship, our politics, that's where they are. If he says our citizenship is in heaven, he doesn't say we have a citizenship in heaven. He says our citizenship is in heaven. Now, there's many Christians that say we have dual citizenship. We're citizens of this earth and we're citizens of heaven. Therefore, we have rights with regard to heaven and rights with regard to earth. But Peter just indicated back here, no, he's writing to aliens and strangers, people that are not citizens. And he's not just saying that you, and some people are going to say that Peter's writing to Jewish believers that are dispersed. And they take the expression dispersion back in 1.1 to refer only to the dispersion of Israel. Um, 
and therefore they come here and they say, well, you Jews now, or you're no longer in Judea, you know, not in that land. And so now you're aliens and strangers. But I believe that if you, if you, oh, you understand that Peter's writing to a broader audience than that, uh, which I, I really believe he is. Um, and there's a number of reasons we could demonstrate that, but it's not our point here today. Um, that I think that what he's really saying is we as believers, we really aren't at home here. This world is not our home. In fact, there's a whole very interesting study in the book of Revelation where we are contrasted to those people that are called earth dwellers, those who are settled down at home on earth. And it's just, it's a one word expression. And then it's expanded with a little addition on that one word, but it's that idea. This isn't our home. And it's a hard thing for us to stop and think about that this is not our home. Now, when we talk about our citizenship, there, there are two passages in the New Testament in which Paul references his Roman citizenship. And people use these to say, well, look at Paul looked at him, himself as a citizen of the world. But I would point out, number one, Philippians is written after both of these events. And I believe that that there's a reason that Paul's going to do these. One of those is wrong, and one of those is, we would say, is kind and caring. In Acts uh, chapter 22, um, and again, I, we could get into a whole I, a whole discussion on what happens here in Acts 21 and 22, but Paul goes down to Jerusalem, and I know this is not a popular view in Christianity, but it's, we are told several times that the Holy Spirit told him not to go up. And even Luke includes himself on more than once that we were telling him not to go up and we were begging him not to go up. But Paul persists in doing this thing that the Holy Spirit, as well as other believers, and even prophets that the Holy Spirit sends to him, tells him not to do. He persists in doing it. Gets himself in trouble by, I really think, compromising trying to win over these Jewish Christians that he's okay, instead of really telling them what they needed to hear, which is, we're not under the law anymore. And eventually, Paul gets arrested, gets pulled down. The, the, he, the, the person over, them, over the soldiers, they, they come down to take Paul away, to rescue him, and, and Paul asks for permission to tell these people the, uh, kind of his history. And he kind of walks through it, but when he gets down really to this, this idea of who Jesus Christ is and what he stands for. They become angry. They're throwing dust and dirt in the air. It says in verse 24, And the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by scourging. That's by a real severe whipping. This isn't one or two lashes. This is a severe scourging, so that they might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. And when they stretched him out with thongs, and as they tie thongs around his, his wrists and pull him out flat, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who was a Roman and uncondemned? And then he goes on and Paul doesn't get whipped. Now, I'm going to honestly say, number one, Paul is already out of the will of God and he has persisted in doing something he was not supposed to do, number one. And number two, being out of the will of God, he, he resorts to his Roman his Roman citizenship, to try to get himself out of being whipped. Okay, have that? It's out of the will of God. I want you to contrast this, interestingly enough, if we go over to Acts 16. Now, this is earlier, but this is the count, account with he and Silas. Now, they've gone there, and they've been arrested for doing the right thing. They've been arrested for evangelism and for freeing a girl from a demon that was causing her to prophesy, shall we say. She wasn't really genuinely prophesying in the, in the absolute biblical sense, but nonetheless, they get in trouble for doing this. And they get whipped. If you, if you know the story, they get whipped and then they get put in jail. And Paul does not say, wait a second, I'm a Roman citizen when he gets whipped. So when he's doing the right thing and he gets in trouble, guess what? Paul doesn't put up a fuss about it. But when he's doing the wrong thing, and he gets whipped. Now he's going, wait a second, I'm a Roman citizen. Now he is in this context going to refer to his Roman citizenship, but it's after the whipping, after being thrown into jail, and after God has divinely provided the ability for Paul to be released from prison through an earthquake and a series of events. 
So verse 35 of Acts 16, Now when day came, the chief magistrates sent their policemen, saying, Release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The chief magistrates have sent to release you. Therefore, come out now and go away in peace. I think they realized they were kind of rash in what they went ahead and did, and they're maybe a little bit nervous, but therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, you have beaten us in public without a trial, men who are Romans, and you have thrown us into prison. Now you're going to send us away secretly? Indeed, let them come out, let those these uh, ruling officials here come out themselves and bring us out. And the police then reported these words to the chief magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans, and they came and appealed to them when they had brought them out. They kept begging them to leave the city. And so they went out of the prison, entered into the house of Lydia. That's where they had been staying in the city. And when they saw the brothers, they encouraged them, and then they departed. I have a good friend that pointed something out on this passage a number of years ago that I think is showing Paul's acting kindly when he's referring to his Roman citizenship. He's already been beaten. He's not getting out of any trouble. It, it, all his, those problems are over. The beating's done. The imprisonment's done. They want Paul just to leave town. Go ahead and leave town. But Paul says, you beat us without a trial, and we were Romans. And I believe, and this is, this is what my friend suggests, and this is just a suggestion, but it, I would suggest to, uh, to you that he's doing this maybe on behalf of these believers. Because when he, leave, when he leaves their, their council, their group of their, the leaders, he actually goes to the house of Lydia and he sees the brothers. In other words, he did this to try to say, if I leave town now, just as is, how do I know that there's not going to be repercussions for these people? But if these people know that I'm a Roman citizen, at least maybe there'll be a little fear of the government put into them. And hopefully they won't give these people any undue trouble. Now, it's just a suggestion. I realize I, I, I don't have a verse that says this is exactly why Paul does this here. But we, know, we realize here Paul has done nothing wrong. Unlike Acts 21 and 22, where Paul calls on his citizenship and he does it to get out of being whipped, but he does it only after he was already warned not to go. Now, all of that to say when we're talking here about this is that you and I really do not possess citizenship on this earth. I, I have a voter card. I just was cleaning out some things uh, in my headboard the other day and I've got my voter card sitting in there uh, with my red cross card and I'm looking at these things and I'm going, I put it in a box there so I know where it is. So the government of the United States considers me to be a citizen of the United States. The state that I live in considers that. The county that I live in considers that. I have the opportunity to vote here. The city that I'm in, I get a, I get a ballot that's uh, with regard to things that be, take place here in my city. They all consider me a citizen on various levels. But I remind myself, this is not my home. My citizenship is in heaven. Having said all this, the 4th of July, should we as Christians just, ah, United States, ah, we're not citizens of this. Well, I remind myself of that so I don't get too tied to this stuff. But there's a statement that Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 2. And he says, I encourage, first of all, that supplication or entreaty, as they have here in the NASB, and prayers or worship, and then intercession and thanks should be made on behalf of all men, on behalf of kings, and all those that are over, uh, and those that are in leadership, in order that we might lead a quiet and peaceful life. The point being is that the way you respond to this world system and the government, and many Christians have been under government systems that are very antagonistic towards believers and Christianity, our culture sometimes really appears that it is becoming increasingly that way. And we talk to God about it. We don't write letters. We don't go out and pick it. We don't go out and yell at the world. We talk to God. But notice in here, and thanksgiving. And thanksgiving. I honestly have to say, I'm, this wasn't something that they, was true for them, but I can say it's true for me. I go to bed at night, I put my head on my pillow, and I don't worry about the fact that the nation to the north of me is going to come rolling down over the hills and trying to conquer us. I don't generally worry that we're going to have roving, roving bands of bandits that are just going to be running all over. We live in a country that keeps order. 
and I don't normally believe, don't normally worry that uh, um, that the government's just going to show up at my door someday and take me away in handcuffs um, for having done anything that's not really wrong according to the law. It's just contrary to to what somebody might think. Take me away because I'm a Christian and I'm a pastor. No. I don't worry about those things. We actually have a, a certain degree of freedom in our country that I think we ought to be thankful for, that we can actually say things and speak freely. And speak freely, mostly, I would say, about the Lord Jesus Christ, which brings me to something I told you at the beginning. If you've stuck it out this far and you are somebody that um, is not a believer in Jesus Christ, you could believe in him today. And today could be your day of freedom. Today could be the day you come to find genuine freedom. Freedom from the guilt of your sin. Freedom from the fear of death. Freedom for what will come in the future. We can actually be free from these things. And we can be free because Jesus Christ went to a cross and died on that cross for our sins. And he was buried and he rose again. And he didn't do it for us because we were great or good people. He did it because there was a demonstration of love to the Father. And he laid down his life in our place. And all you have to do is believe. You don't have to come join a church or get baptized or do a bunch of good works or give money to anybody. You just have to believe right where you are that he did it all. And you can enjoy real freedom. Freedom that even though we live in, what do we call, what's the song? The land of the free? Mm, even more freedom than that will ever promise or ever allow. And I hope you as a believer remember that. It's only in Christ, as we are citizens of heavens, that we have real, real, lasting, eternal freedom. Think about those things. Remember who you are in Christ today. Have a good day in the Lord, and thank you for joining me.